Okay, so I think we'll get started. Welcome everyone. I'm Erin Becker, director of the Cambridge Art <clears throat> Association, and we're delighted to be here with you tonight for our 2024 Members Prize Show Artist Talk. Uh, the four artists who are joining us tonight are four of our five artists of the year, as selected by Mike Carroll, our juror. Mike is the director of the Schoolhouse Gallery in Provincetown. If you've never been there, we encourage you to head out there this summer. They are always doing wonderful things. Um, the artists will be presenting in alphabetical order, um, and you can see their work in real life at our Catherine Schultz Gallery and at CAA at University Place through the end of April. So we're going to kick things off tonight with Kay Hartung. And Kay is an Acton mass based encaustic artist. And tonight she's gonna to be discussing one of her new series that delves into the realms of color form and geometry. So welcome Kay. And you're muted. So just make sure you unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. First of all, I want to thank Mike Carroll, the juror, and Cambridge Art Association for giving me this award. This is a new series of work and getting the award was a welcome affirmation for me. This is the piece that uh, won the award. And um, this is an encaustic piece on the shaped wood panel. For those of you that don't know encaustic, um, it's a wax-based paint that is heated and applied in a liquid state. Uh, it's a wonderful material to work with, and uh, I've been working with it for uh, about 12 years. In this series, I'm interested in the interactions of color, form, and geometry. The shape paintings take on identities and personalities of their own transcending the boundaries of visual representations. I see them as characters, slightly imbalanced and whimsical, full of color and contrast. They reference architecture, music, nature, and the human body, and relate to symbols of stability and the shelter of home. As I developed the series, I began to think about what sounds they might make. My husband, Paul, a musician, has composed short tunes to go along with some of the pieces that can be heard from the QR code on the label. Uh, the only instructions I had for him was that the tunes sound happy. The instruments vary with each piece. It's intentional that the tunes are last only about 15 to 20 seconds. So they sort of correspond with the typical viewing time. We can now listen to the music for this piece. In these tumultuous times, my artwork serves as an antidote, a visual sanctuary that offers respite from the darkness that surrounds us. Through my exploration of color relationships and the interplay of abstract elements, I strive to create a space where hope and vibrancy flourish. Next slide. I thought it would be interesting <laughs> to know how this series developed. For the summer of 2022, my studio building was closed, so I could not do encaustic. So what do I do? I start sketching in a sketchbook. So I did these small thumbnail sketches, playing around with ideas about geometric forms, trying to break out of the rectangular format. My love of color is why I'm an artist. So I wanted to use vibrant colors and to go with these um, sort of odd whimsical forms. Next slide. After painting on paper with 
uh, acrylic. Um, I, I wasn't satisfied with the flatness uh, that these forms had on the page. Um, I, I wanted to liberate the forms from the page. I wanted to give them just more presence. So I tried some acrylic paint, but I, I really didn't love the look of it. Uh, I was then able to get a temporary studio, so I started to work in encaustic again. Uh, my husband cuts out the wood pieces for me, by the way, with a scroll saw. Uh, the first few pieces I did, um, we can go to the next slide, uh, were totally smooth, uh, something that you can achieve with encaustic. And um, I, I, I love the look of the encaustic. It just had so much more body and presence to it than the encaustic paint. Then I started creating textures in some of the shapes and had the contrast of smooth areas and textured areas. We'll go on to the next slide. I then went on to using texture in all of the sh shapes. Next slide. So you can see here, this is uh, one that shows the contrast between the smooth and textured areas. Next slide. And then this is one where all the areas got textured. And uh, the textures are really kind of fun to discover different ways to create these textures. Um, sometimes I incise lines and then build up by successive layers that sort of catch onto the burrs of the incised lines. Uh, sometimes I use stencils. Sometimes it's, it's just the textures created with the paintbrush. Uh, and sometimes I use netting from fruit bags to create the textures. I'm continuing with the series and starting to build pieces with some shapes protruding out a bit. Um, I've also created some pieces using my wood scraps and a, a more muted palette. I will be continuing this series, I think, for quite a while. Thank you for listening. Um, hope to uh, get some questions at the end. Wonderful. Thank you, Kay. It's wonderful to learn more about the progression and also just highlights how artists often have to adapt to workspaces and things like that. And it's all about experimentation. Um, there's a nice comment in the chat from Mary Lynn Burke. And folks, if you do have questions for Kay, feel free to drop them in the chat or we'll have time at the end of the presentations to address questions for all of the artists. So our next presenter this evening is Lydia Kinney. Lydia is a painter based in Greenfield, Mass. And you'll see that her art uh, articulates your relationship to the self and her sort of means of doing so is via abstraction. Um, you actually see one of her pieces right behind me on my wall. Um, so welcome tonight, Lydia. And we're gonna put you in the spotlight. Hi folks. Um, thanks a bunch for having me, having me in the show having me as an artist of the year. Um, we're, we're starting with guts, which I think I've already described in like social media posts as my kind of crown jewel of embarking in a full-time studio practice. Um, I've been full-time since last August and just making a lot more work. Um, and I think this one this particular piece really gets at the visual language that I'm trying to cultivate of kind of a portal into an imagined space and a, a developed obstruction and pathway into it. Um, where ideally, if I could put like a a drawer pull right into the center of this painting and pull it out like an accordion to show you every layer, that would be ideal. I think the next best thing for me is to use enough transparency and have enough surrender in my process to know that even if it's not all visible, it's all present. 
Um, I can move on to the next slide. So my artist statement talks a fair bit about, I think, maybe some pretty cynical concepts um, where there's, I think, future tense loss is a term that I, I use. And there's an element of surrender and permission for me to be an artist at all and further to work in such like deep non-objective visual language where I'm not beholden to an imagination of, of anything really more tangible than that. Um, it's kind of an environment that I get to make for myself to imagine something that I'm more optimistic for, more comfortable in, more capable of. Um, I can go on to the next slide. <laughs> Sorry. Gilder is an older piece that, um, older, it's from 2022, um, that is, is a key piece of a switch away from building kind of an environment denoted by like a floor plane and like a space and more into this like direct confrontational portal and these like amorphous ornaments surrounding it. Um, all of these works are acrylic on panel or canvas. I'm, I'm doing a lot of like building shapes through, through masking and having a really hard line. And then a lot of glazing paint over really pretty thick. Um, and a lot of sanding down with the power sander and then building back up. Um, the next slide shows that pretty well. Um, where there's no guarantee when you sand a piece down, um, what's gonna be exposed afterwards. It's not one-to-one, -one, you put a layer on, you take it back off because of buildup, just because of different pigment, different adhesion, things can get a little less predictable than that. Um, and so I'm looking for kind of a surface treatment, not on like veils or curtains or some opacity and some mystique, um, but also a lot of remnants of previous process. Um, next slide, please. This is a piece on panel and really exemplifies that process because there's there's like poured paint on there that probably gets up to like a 16th of an inch thick. There's lots of like vague ornamentation and there's also just like the surrender to the process that I have sanded it back down to the exposed panel. Um, this is a really little piece, but a favorite of mine. Um, next slide, please. This is still, it's a similar process, but a little more planar. Um, and I think this is early 2022. I can see myself getting towards wanting to build an environment for myself and kind of a portal and almost like a like a revered portrait of that space. And I'm almost there with this. Um, and my last slide is ribbon. Um, another smaller piece, this is 14 by 11. And that, that same sort of ornamentation and building and then this somewhat offset blockade into that space. Um, yeah, I'm just, I'm really compelled by what I can build for myself in a painting process that maybe doesn't, it, not that it's a one-to-one -one relationship, but what maybe I, I can't have in such an uncertain future. Those Thanks, are very Aaron. interesting thoughts. Yeah, no, that's amazing. I mean, they are, they draw you in like a portal. And this is, this is a lot more white space for you than I am 
accustomed to. So it's interesting to see that as the 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 jumping off point. It is. It's funny how much easier it is to take a risk like that on a small piece. Do you think you would expand that idea onto something larger? Yeah. Yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> well, thank you. Again, some thank nice you. comments in the chat. Folks, if you do have questions for Lydia, again, put them in the chat or we'll have time at the end for Q&A. Thank you, Lydia. We're moving right along. We're gonna have a lot of time for chat. Um, so our third presenter, um, a lot of painters this year as artists of the year. Our third presenter is Charles Marburg. Charles is a painter uh, who is again, working in abstraction primarily and his piece, Identity, Memory and Dislocation is a meditation on immigration. So welcome Charles. Can you hear me now? Yes. Hi, I'm glad to be here. Um, I'm happy to be a part of this group. And uh, there's the, the painting that was in the show. It's, uh, I'm not really a, a, a political artist, but like, you know, everybody else, certain issues grab you and uh, they come out in your work. Um, not, you know, at at the end, really, when you're trying to do something. Um, the way I work is, is that I have a built up over the years, many portfolios of uh, hand cut stencils. And uh, those are shapes that uh, come from drawings originally or other paintings. And uh, the reason I started creating in the first place is because I thought would find an uh, interesting shape in a painting and think I, I can do something else with that. So that would be a jumping off point for another painting. Um, and that's sort of the way I work. I never, I really go, uh, I never really stare at a blank canvas. I always have some shape that I've taken from something else uh, that I start the work with. And it may end up completely different uh, than what I originally intended, which is the case here. Um, and it sort of gelled at some point and I realized what it was about, what, what was on my mind at the time. And, um, it just seemed, uh, you know, fit, uh, uh, title for this because it sort of embodied for me all the, the hope, you know, and memory and, um, what, what one's leaves behind in coming to this country, you know, and it's been such a divisive issue that um, uh, I was glad, you know, to, to give sort of a hopeful uh, rendition of it um, in this work. And uh, can we go on to the next slide? Um, this, again, started um, with some stencil shapes uh, and uh, became sort of a mood piece from last summer and uh with the final thing put in that gigantic moon uh at rest is what this painting is called and uh, there are several uh, shapes that i use from other paintings that are in this and don't work out and they get sort of painted over and it gets built up and you get a certain atmosphere um and uh here i'm i'm concentrating more on, you know, making that one shape of the circle uh, work in a very atmospheric uh, ground um, to create a mood of sort of serenity. Um, next painting, please. I mean, so this is a lot of my paintings, um, uh, when they work originally from this stencil, they're in a more unfinished state like this one, uh, which started with a uh, small stencil of a uh, small figure uh, uh, in the middle of that painting uh, that was taken from another painting. And then I just made a big stencil uh, to put around it. Mm. And uh, that was that, you know, it's, it's sometimes it works and you move on. So uh, that's uh, the, the, uh, 
the story with this one. And I have a lot of works that sort of go into two categories. Um, I mean, really, the, this, mm -hmm. which is more unfinished, and then the two previous ones, which are, you know, the original doesn't really work out, and I just keep going at it and uh, uh, exploring relationships of, and trying things out with new shapes uh, and colors. So uh, can we go to the next one? So um, here's a case, uh, mm -hmm. my brush, uh, which is sort of a self-portrait mm -hmm. in a way, um, that I started again with um, mm -hmm. stencils uh, that really didn't work out. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so I decided to, to you know, work on creating a moody uh, background. And uh, the, the brush uh, shape just sort of came out of uh, what I was doing. I was, oh, you know, that's my brush. So that's that's what happened. It's just sort of evolved. I didn't start out with the idea of, of painting uh, uh, my brush. And uh, so next one. So uh, this one, although it looks blurry, it's not actually. That's the way I painted it. And it, it, you can see more clearly sort of uh, the use of uh, stencils in in this one, um, and here I was obviously really working more with color relationships, and I was trying to get sort of uh, a very transitory note. Uh, like this is just a is like a a snapshot from a moving car, um, which, are, which is the way I I worked on it to the end. Uh, you know, just something you see out of the corner of your eye uh, that stays with you. Um, and, uh, okay, next one. This one uh, is, again, taking a stencil base that I use from something else. And I call this one on the flip side because the only thing I did here was take the stencil uh, and use the positive and the negative of it. You see on one side is the positive and the other side is the negative of the stencil. And, um, you know, it just came together very quickly. Um, uh, and, you know, so that's that's another example of when it works right away, <laughs> you know, just leave it alone. Um, so that's, uh, that's it. Uh, most of my paintings are on the small side. Uh, uh, I like the scale. Um, yeah, the, uh, this one is uh, 16 by uh, 20 inches, and that's a size I like to work with a lot. And um, I use a lot of um, uh, mm. sort of inexpensive uh, mm. canvases because I can just go through them and not and not uh, worry about. Uh, Am I wasting money? <laughs> you know, because materials are always have, you know, a cost to them. And I spent a great deal of time earlier, you know, working on very nice canvases on very nice frames that, that cost a lot of money. <laughs> and uh, I found I was getting, you know, like stuck. Well, I've got to do something on this so that it works. So the simple thing of, of using a cheaper uh, material to wor work on really freed me up um, and allowed me... Uh, to try different things and just move on. So uh, that was very helpful. So um, that's really all I have to say on it. Okay, well, thank you, Charles. Um, mm -hmm. Interesting, we've got a lot of abstraction going on and also a lot of folks who are working relatively small scale. Um, it's always interesting to me in these artist talks to see some of the commonalities among our presenters. Um, so thank you. Um, and it's just about the halfway mark in the hour. We're going to move on to our final presenter of the night, Gail Samuelson. Gail is a photographer who splits her time between a town southwest of Boston and Cape Cod. Um, and actually the photos in this series are smaller scale for Gail as well. Um, known her work for a number of years. Um, this series of photographs uh, reflect on her profound feelings of sadness over the death of her baby grandson, Jude, and that his death evoked a commitment to carry on, to make the most of her time, to practice patience, and to point out beauty when she sees it. 
Dark Morning, the next slide is part of this series. Welcome, Gail. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone who's here. Um, I'm so happy that um, y'all came. And thank you, Aaron and Candice. Um, it's a great opportunity. It's always wonderful to be able to show a single photograph in context with its mates in venues like this. And Mike Carroll, thank you so much. I'm a big fan of Schoolhouse Gallery and a frequent visitor, and it made this award extra special for me. Um, I also wanna thank Emily Bells. Um, I wouldn't be the photographer I am today without her help. And um, anyhow, thank you so much everyone for coming. Um, I wanna start out, um, and you can keep this slide up just to give a little background to this project. Um, my photograph, Dark Morning, um, belongs to a project in response, as Aaron said, it, a response to a difficult and sad event um, and time in my life. I'm showing eight of the photographs that are in a larger group of images um, tonight. Uh, things were rolling along nicely with some ups and downs, but life was good. My husband and I have three happily married children that get all, all get along, six grandchildren, and we were eagerly awaiting the birth of our seventh grandchild, Jude. Then what felt like out of nowhere, Jude was born with a rare set of congenital defects that critically narrowed his airway, making breathing difficult and eventually impossible. I was at a workshop in Maine when he was failing. I left midweek to say goodbye to him and he died the next day. Jude lived his life and was loved in the NICU at Boston Children's Hospital for 109 days. His death was a crushing blow to our family, especially to his mother, our daughter, Jessie, and her husband, Trevor. We were heartbroken, but he just wasn't built for this world. And I can't tell the story of Jude without mentioning my other daughter, Ariel, a pedi pediatrician at Children's Hospital who guided us with such grace through thick and thin and was by her sister's side every step of the way. I have a note here that I should breathe. <laughs> when they teach medicine, students are instructed to look for the most common diagnosis first and not to go looking for zebras or less likely reasons. Well, Jude was our zebra and we became his dazzle. Um, next slide, please. My photographs serve as a visual journal that helped me put form to my feelings around Jude's struggle to live and his eventual passing. Many were made last October at a wonderful photography and white, um, writing retreat in Italy run by Elizabeth Ains of Nord Photography and taught by Sal Taylor Kidd. The timing of this workshop couldn't have been better um, because it gave me time and space to work through my grief with the support of compassionate people. I wandered the Tuscan landscape with its long views of cypress trees, farmland, and historic buildings and made my photographs. I found peace in this place doing what I love to do. Half of the images I'm showing tonight are from that workshop and from a few days afterwards in Rome with my pal, Ellen. I photograph intuitive, intuitively and then spend a lot of time looking at my images um, and, from, and learning from my images as meanings emerged. Some observations and themes. For the last 10 years, my work has lar been largely about color, color in my house, in the landscape, and in my family life and objects. But in this case, I printed in black and white in a monochromatic tonality to emphasize shape and structure, shadows and light. Focusing on form grounded me. Um, I found a quote from a photographer from the photographer and writer Robert Adams, a very wonderful writer about how form brings hope. And I quote, um, form helps us confront our worst fear, the suspicion that life may be chaos and that therefore our suffering is without meaning. This quote, quote resonated with me as I worked to find some peace and solace surrounding the tragic and solemn event. You may also notice lines running through the frames of several of my photographs. A spider, you can move to the next slide. Um, a spider silk trace, well, um, anyhow. A spider silk traces through the landscape, a telephone wire bisects a murmuration of birds and lines of paint drip down a torso painted on an old wall. 
Lines can signify many things. They point to disruptions, breaks, and random occurrences that can culminate in super bad luck, like with Jude. Lines can be used as a metric, marking the passage of time and duration of a life. And lastly, and more positively, lines can represent bonds, resilient connections that hold things together, as in this case, the support and love of family ties. Another theme um, you may notice is that of birds. A lot has been written about the symbolism of birds. They represent freedom, hope, strength, and joy. And based on their ability to soar into the sky, they are believed to be a link between the spiritual and material worlds. Subconsciously in my photography, I was seeking out uplifting images of hope and beauty. To our extended family, Jude's brief life became an urgent reminder that life is short and precious and should be enjoyed. There will always be sadness and grief, and there will always be beauty and joy. It's a matter of holding them together. Thanks. Thank you, Gail. That's, um, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that is a beautiful tribute to your grandson and a beautiful way to carry on um, his legacy and also in your life. It, they, these things in life are hard. Thank you. Um, thank you for joining us, everyone.